Hello and welcome to Premier League All Access with me, Sam Matterface, the former Arsenal winger Perry Groves, and I'm delighted to say for the first time, Ricky Hayward Williams is here. Here's what's coming up on what is a thrilling show. When Liverpool were losing their game, you said, that's it now, it's a different pressure on the shoulders of the players. And do you think that weighed heavily on them? I think it did. When you've got games like that, which you know that you're struggling in, you just don't get beat. I just, I just couldn't see Arsenal dropping points in this particular picture. I don't know, I don't know how this has happened. Salah, I love him to death, but he hasn't really been at the races since he's come back. Has um, he gone off the ball? I yeah, think I think, yeah. think his finishing has been really sloppy, Mo yeah. Salah, to be fair. I think if you looked at that team on paper, that's probably Liverpool's best 11 at this moment in time. Look, Ange Postacoglu has won seven titles in his career. He's done a brilliant job in several different countries, but he is in danger of being part of the reason, at least, for them throwing away a very good start to the season. Sam, one word, Spursy. Andy Gordon, he's playing his way into starting for England on that left-hand side. He was outstanding. That's not a great look, is it, from Garnacho, his people, whoever runs his social media. Garnacho knows that uh, Eric Ten Hag is going. Right. You think he's toast? Out. Yes, I do. Very you okay? Thrilling show, really. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen the uh, results today. Uh, obviously, uh, Perry very much aligned to uh, Arthur from his playing days. Ricky, a big Liverpool fan. Massive Liverpool fan, so like Perry. Should we have a hug? Should we just shut right, You're right, Bring it in. Right, bring it in. Sorry, bring it it's in. only a game. <laughs> it's only a game, Ricky. It's only a game. Is everybody who isn't a Manchester City fan feeling rather down? Because not only did the results, Arsenal end up losing to Aston Villa at home and Liverpool losing at home to Crystal Palace, sort of give it the initiative to Manchester City. Actually, it means that Manchester City, based on their history, have gone from outsiders a week ago to bang favourites. And now everybody just expects them to win all the remaining games and lift the title for a full successive year. Is that good for the Premier League? Is that, what you're, is that the nar narrative that you're going for? Because there's a lot of Manchester City fans <laughs> that are dancing around the, the room after today's results. It's definitely not good for the Premier League. It's, it's probably been the, the most title fan. race in years. Three horse race. Uh, we wanted it to go right down to the wire. Today, kind of thrown a spanner in the works a little bit. Um, well, I don't Big think spanner. It's over. I don't think it's over. No, I don't think all it is, it means that there's no room for error yeah. for Liverpool or Arsenal. And at this stage of the season, you want the title in your own hands. And exactly what's happened to Man City. And if there's one team that you don't want to put it in the hands of, it's Man City. It's Let's Man be City, honest. Because yeah. so we're not saying congratulations, Pep Guardiola. Yeah. No. <laughs> Well, oh, we, no. <laughs> we, we mentioned earlier they've got four away games, Man City. You mentioned they've got four away games. Never told you who those four away games I'm, are. I'm clutching to those straws, Sam. <laughs> you said to me, Nottingham Forest, they're, they're fighting for something. Yeah, Fulham, you never know. Spurs, that would be irony if they end up helping us like, win the title. Brighton have won for about six years. <laughs> They'll be playing free, though, Brighton. There's no fear with Brighton. You never know. You never know. You're absolutely right. Anything uh, can happen. So let's look in detail a little bit more at the title race as both Liverpool and Arsenal lose on Sloppy Sunday. <laughs> Arsenal nil Aston Villa too. Now, Perry Groves and I were doing a show together a little bit earlier on uh, today. And when Liverpool lost earlier in the day, Perry caused a bit of a stir by saying Liverpool bottled it against Crystal Palace. I was being ironic, And that's Sam. coming back to haunt you. I said to you at the time, don't say that, Perry, because if you do say that, you know if things go wrong, you started to backtrack, backtrack, backtrack. By the way, the text machine after the game, <laughs> red hot. Context, I was being ironic. I was joking and bottled it. Did because Arsenal bottle it today or did they um, uh, get beaten by a better team better who team. tactically out them? Brilliant. Uh, Unai Emery going back to the Emirates. I was a bit worried about that. Oh, the spice. Martinez going back as well. Yep. So uh, Ex-Arsenal like goalkeeper. And when I was watching, we was watching the game, wasn't we on air? Arsenal played well first half. They had like, a bit of control, even though Ollie Watkins, obviously at the inside of the post, it looked like it was going in. Then Tielemans has a brilliant shot, you know, from the uh, right-hand side of Arsenal's box where Zinchenko should like, win the tackle. It's the inside of post and bar. And, when, and Arsenal were very, very nervous in the second half. You could tell that the passing had gone awry, awry a little bit. I thought you might, Arteta might have brought Jorginho on a little bit earlier. Mm. And then when I'm looking at it, I didn't say anything to you, but I was actually, I'd have settled for a nil-nil draw. Because when you've got games like that, which you know that you're struggling in, you just don't get beat. And... It's just frustrating as an Arsenal fan because obviously it's in your hands and all of a sudden, obviously we've Liverpool get beaten earlier on. We'll talk about that later as well. Then you think it's a great chance for you to kick on there and 
keep Man City under pressure. Mm -hmm. And what you've done is you've allowed Man City a little bit of a leeway. Well, Arsenal were unbeaten in 11 Premier League games before uh, today. Uh, they took 31 points from 33. They scored 38 and conceded four. Didn't score today. And actually, Aston Villa deserved it, didn't they, Ricky? They hit the woodwork twice. Uh, Ollie Watkins with the uh, shot from the edge of the area, hitting yep. the inside of the post, and then Tielemans' effort, which I think nearly took the goal post out. <laughs> I think Ollie Watkins deserves a lot of credit because he's playing out of his skin. He's had the season of his life so far. Not quite working out for him at England, but in an Aston Villa shirt, he's absolutely smashing it. Um, I just, I just couldn't see Arsenal dropping points in this particular fixture. I don't know, I don't know how this has happened. I was on my way down here uh, in the car listening to it. I get out of the car, it was nil-nil. I get up I get up in the elevator and it's 2-0. I'm like, what, what's gone wrong? Like, what has happened? To be fair, the first goal um, is a bad mistake at the near post where Saliba and Gabriel should actually be um, dealing with it and the ball comes right across the um, six-yard box and Leon Bailey taps it at the far post. Declan Rice isn't aware of him. And the second goal, because Arsenal pressing, then Ollie Watkins times his run brilliantly, to be fair. Jorginho gives the ball away. Yeah, he gives the ball away, but he times his run because he makes sure he stays in his own half. Mm. And then he goes through and Emil Smith throws alongside him. And it's a brilliant finish from Ollie Watkins as he just gets into the box. Maybe Dev Ray goes down a little bit too early. And Ollie Watkins, you know when sometimes you judge players? I judge players by their away performances. And that's his um, eighth Premier League goal in... Uh, five away games, which is amazing. You, you talked a lot about this in the build-up to the game. Revengi, you said. Uh, lots yeah. of Revengi in the air because <laughs> they beat you uh, up Villa Park earlier We were Jared Gillotted, I think. And I you said. were moaning about the VAR <laughs> yeah. in that scenario. But actually, Unai Emery maybe showed a little bit of Revengi by coming back to haunt Arsenal because he got everything almost spot on. And I'll give him credit because we talked a lot yesterday about the problems that Spurs had with their high line. Well, usually Aston Villa, you know, play the high line, cause themselves problems occasionally, but they adapted today to make sure that they nullified Arsenal's attack and then had the threat in behind themselves. I think, I don't think Unai Emery gets as much of the credit that he should deserve. I think he's an elite manager. Um, it didn't end well from Arsenal and it's just, it's great for him to come back. Sorry, Bell, but it's great for him to come back to the Emirates and do what he's done <laughs> like, at this moment of the season as well, because... Arsenal fans would kill for a performance like that right now, surely. Can I ask you, you're a big Liverpool fan. Yeah. When you were watching the Arsenal game or following the Arsenal game after you'd found out that you'd lost, were you hoping that Arsenal won the match? Lost the match? Drew the match? Where, what was your position on it? Because you've already mentioned that you don't think it's great for the Premier League yeah. that Manchester City now have a cushion and could possibly go on and win the title. Yeah. So what were you thinking when... <laughs> Just to save my mental health, Sam, I was thinking I was I wasn't thinking too hard on on whether you know Liverpool could still do it because I just think to myself, do you know what, like let the results take care of themselves. But this Arsenal game, I personally wanted them to just I thought they could drop points, but just like in a draw. I thought a draw was possible. I didn't think Arsenal were in a position after the last few games. They've been they've been uh, in great form. I thought they'd be able to at least get a draw. I didn't think they'd drop like, <laughs> all three points. I didn't think that was going to happen. Uh, Ollie Watkins uh, finished good, but took a little deflection off Emil Smith Rowe's getting back with him. Uh, Alex Zinchenko, another problem at left back, struggled a little bit today, pulled out of a challenge. Tielemans hit the, the crossbar. They've had a problem of, of sorting out that issue. Yuri and Timber can't get back up to speed quick enough, mm. can he? Yep, and uh, Kibbe obviously has been playing yeah. there, who's normally like a, a centre half. Him, yeah. Straight that, that's why he got the hook up half time. Mm. But Zinchenko, what I think. The reason I take the play today because he wanted to get control with midfield because Inchenko goes in there. And Odegaard was very good in the first half. In the second half, then he started just to sort of drift off a little bit. And I say that the passing wasn't great from Arsenal. And then you're just thinking, I thought Arteta might have put Jorginho on a little bit earlier because that's what he does when you're not controlling games. Mm -hmm. He goes and sits at the base of the midfield and he, he controls it. And um, it was a, a really, as I said, nervy... Um, Difficult performance in the second half, and now it's it can't forever. be hard. It can't. It can't be easy going last in that. In that, you know, in, in those fixtures after City, after after Liverpool, and then having to come. But that's, this is interesting because that's what you were saying. I said when, a different pressure when Liverpool were losing their game. You said that's it. Now it's a different pressure on the shoulders of the players. Yeah. Can they deal with that? Because now they're expected to go and win, give themselves an advantage in the title race, 
And do you think that weighed heavily on them? I think it did. I think, I've yeah. got to be honest, I'm a massive Guna. I think definitely in the second half, because in the first half, Leandro Trossard had a brilliant chance, didn't he, where he should be putting it. He, everybody said brilliant save for Martinez, but he's only, what, five yards out, middle of the goal, he should be scoring. And when you're, when you're chasing, then you're under less pressure. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. you think, right, but to be fair, if there's one team you don't want to be top of the league that you're chasing, who aren't going to feel the pressure, is going to be Man City because yeah. of the manager, because of the players. But then you just hope that, obviously, the further they're going to go, which I think they'll beat Real Madrid and they go in the Champions League, you know, they have those mm -hmm. two that they're going for. You hope that they might just take their eye off the ball. But um, it's, it's still going to be interesting and I said it'll go to the last it sounds you know, it's a very... I've just watched him squirm all afternoon very... after sort of almost reveling in the fact that Liverpool had lost and then he went through that sort of you know, that whole spectrum of feeling really confident at the beginning of the game to feeling a little bit sort of anxious to feeling pure anxiety <laughs> blood pressure going through the roof to despair all in the space of 90 minutes. I had about minutes. seven peppermint teas just like just calm myself <laughs> that exactly. and about 150 Percy pigs as well during the course of the afternoon we must pay tribute to Ollie Watkins who has equaled the record of Christian Benteke's 19 in 2012-13 as the top scorer for Aston Villa in the Premier League era he'll go on and get more than that he's now got level goals with Erling Haaland he's had the most direct goal involvements in the Premier League of any player this season uh, 29, 19 goals, 10 assists. Well done uh, to him. He's been absolutely terrific and he deserves all the plaudits that are coming his way. This game was hot on the heels of another game that we watched, which was the Liverpool uh, defeat at home against Crystal Palace. Um, how has it happened twice in a week after being imperious at uh, Anfield that they even lost without scoring? Yeah. Do you know what? I feel like this result, Obviously, it's easy to say in hindsight, but I feel like this result's been coming because obviously, if you look at the two Manchester United games, you know, Liverpool always give teams a chance. We always start quite slowly. Um, you know, it's been spoken about in, um, you know, in high regard that Liverpool can come back from being a goal down or being two goals down or whatever it might be. You almost but, got to the point where you expect them to come back. Correct. Yeah, exactly. But there's only so many times you can do that, right? And if you're in a title race, you know, I remember when we won the league a few years back and that team just didn't give anything away. We could we could just shut up shop, keep the ball, ping it around. Um, if you wanted to have a fight, they could have a fight. This team, they just can't they just can't keep the door closed. We always can see goals. Do you think that there's any legitimacy in the argument? We mentioned this on Thursday's podcast when we had Darren Lewis with us, and I mentioned it to you today on the Sunday session. Any legitimacy in the accusation that Jurgen Klopp's departure, although it may well have inspired the Liverpool players for the first month or so after the announcement. Actually, now when you get to the business end of the season and it's coming towards that point where every result matters, that it's the anxiety of letting down that yeah. that 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 final great big push, that, the that last wonderful dance, the last moment, dance. giving him the last dance. Yeah. That is the anxiety and the tension that's crept in that has stopped them from being able to do it. Because let's be honest, They've created chances. They've created yeah. enough chances to win three games over the course of the last two. Yeah, yeah. But haven't taken them. Yeah, I think um, you know we can't hide away from the fact that our our forwards haven't been clinical. They haven't been on fire. We know that Diaz, great player. He's not a sadio. He's not a killer. He's not a killer in front of goal. He's a dribbler. He can take people on, but he's not really a killer. He's been he's been he's done great uh, in the last few weeks, but he's not the guy that if I see him going through one goal, but I think he's gonna he's gonna bury it. We know what Nunes is like. He causes chaos. He creates chances, but he's not clinical. And um, and we said about um, with Liverpool, in the last two games, they've had 49 shots against Manchester United. Obviously, against Crystal Palace, and scored twice. I yeah. think they've missed Jota. I think he's been a because yeah. he's probably the most clinical finisher out of that. Uh, five that can play um, up front. And I, I think as well, Jurgen Klopp announcing that he was going, I said before, whatever business you're in, if you know that your boss is going at the end of a certain period of time, subconsciously, you just ease off a little bit. You just, because you know they're not going to be your boss in that, um, you know, when that mm. time's finished. Even when the prize is so yes, great. Yes, I think, yeah, yeah, football is a human as well. Do you know what I mean? It's, you go through the same human emotions. I, I think, Jurgen Klopp, they had to announce it because maybe it was going to get leaked yeah. before, so they had to sort of own the story. Um, from Liverpool's point of view as well, if you think 
Obviously, Jurgen Klopp's going. Virgil van Dijk doesn't know what he's doing at the moment. Mo Salah yeah. looks like so. So it's the end of a, a dynasty. Yeah. And I know that there's a lot of good young players at Liverpool, but that's going to be a massive turnaround for whatever manager goes in there. Yeah. Because especially the way that Liverpool have been ingrained to play, where it's the mayhem football, it's the pressing. Yeah. A bit like Bielsa at uh, Leeds. You know, when you've used to been used to playing away for five, three, four, five seasons, yeah. with Liverpool, it's nine, ten seasons. So that said, they've that's got to get the job. next managerial appointment absolutely <laughs> spot on. At the yeah. moment, we think it's going to be Ruben Amorini. He is the out and out favourite by a country mile. And by yeah. the way, he plays three at the back. Yeah, he does. He doesn't lend himself to that sort of football. Will he have to adapt or will they have to adapt? I think I think the players will have to adapt 100%. If a new manager comes in, you've got to do what what that manager wants. That's why he's been brought in. He's you know he's brought in on his credentials. He looks like he's you know he's done well uh, in the, in the Portuguese league. Um, and I think <laughs> he looks the part. He looks like he ticks a lot of boxes. But you know time will tell. But just to go back on the point that you were making before, Sam, about I can't speak for the players. Are they you know anxious and whatnot? But from a fan's perspective, 100%. Every single game feels like it's like <laughs> life or death. Yeah. So if that feels like that to the fans, that's going to translate to the players on the pitch, I feel, and that can create, you know, what we're talking about. You had a good point, because you said you was at the Atlanta game on Thursday. Yeah. And you could see that Liverpool lost their shape completely. We're talking mm. about Skamaka looked like Erling Haaland. But I thought he got the team good. selection wrong on Thursday night, 100%, right? 100%, yep. So he got the team selection wrong, then tried to readjust, but by the time he'd readjusted, the momentum was with Atalanta. Yep. The guys who came into the team couldn't get straight into the game. Yep. And then by the time that they started to get to the point where they found their rhythm, all of a sudden, they have conceded another two goals. Today, he made five changes to that team. I think if you looked at that team on paper, that's yeah. probably Liverpool's best 11 at this moment in time, with the exception of Diogo Jota, who came yeah. off the bench. Yeah, absolutely. And there was a hangover in the first half from mm. the Atalanta mm. game. And if you look at Eze's goal, which was a brilliant goal from Crystal Palace's point of view, obviously, yeah. Tyrek Mitchell gets to the byline and, like, cuts it back and Eze lets it go across his body and scores. But there wasn't a Liverpool player within probably two yards of getting close to close yeah. down or to a Crystal Palace player. When Eze picks the ball up initially, he's in like the 10 position, he's got five yards of yeah. space. That doesn't happen when Liverpool are on it yeah. because we know about the closing down. So there's all these just at the elite sport, elite level, it's just these little mm. um, details that sometimes can go missing. And that's what happened with Liverpool today. So what I are you think telling me? Like 21 passes before that goal, weren't they? I think, like in the lead up to that goal yeah. for Crystal Palace, and we just couldn't get near them. Well, this is which is a bit of a problem. And congratulations to Oliver Glasner, who I actually think has instilled a little bit of organisation and pattern of play, which wasn't apparent uh, earlier in the I season. I think Mateta looks amazing under well, me. Well, fantastic. To be fair, the they could have missed a chance. Exactly, yeah. could have gone two up when he went through one v one. And what happens if you're Elise who come back in and obviously Eze looked brilliant because we was watching it, wasn't we? And he's a player that you love watching play yeah. football yeah. you got Mateta up front and you know full well with him it's going to stick he's good to go before to mm. the Liverpool game he's got four and six I think in the Premier League if it sticks and then he can bring Elise and Eze into their game Palace are fine yeah. they're absolutely fine I well, know fine as long as they you, keep hold of them yeah but you've got mm. the up with Oliver Glasner as well for saying that he didn't well, look he was at the league nonsense, table wasn't he? he was saying <laughs> he doesn't look at, <laughs> doesn't the, league look at the league table, table and doesn't really <laughs> care about whether or not they have a certain number of points all he cares about <laughs> is how they play and, and, and that's it. I thought, well, no, everyone does care <laughs> about the fact that they finish in a certain place in the table. Everyone does care well, whether they job. win or lose. Yeah. This whole idea, and actually Jürgen Klopp was a little bit guilty of it, suggesting that they weren't really talking about the title race today. He was talking about the way the team played. And it doesn't matter where you are in the table, whether you get three points or not. If you play well, you'll get three points. And if you get three points over the course of the season, more often than not, you'll be in the title race. And I was almost a bit like, well, no. <laughs> yes, I understand you've got to have a philosophy and you've got to play regularly yeah. to your strengths and you've got to have an identity. But also, this is about winning, right? So you do look at the table and you do target games and you do know that at this start part of the season, when everybody else is putting three points on the board, you've got to do that no matter what. Forget how you play. Yeah. You've just got to get the result, which is why you know it gets very urgent towards the end of matches and why people are desperate to get three points because they actually do know, yep. realistically, what the situation is well, in the just, table. If Ollie was watching, uh, you're full team and you're on 33 points, so you're going to be fine. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> Ollie, don't worry. Now you've been in Liverpool, you're going to be OK. 33, we think, will be enough to keep you in the Premier League this uh, season. Um, let me ask you a question about Thursday night. Atalanta yep. away. What do you do now for your Jurgen Klopp? Do you go for it? Try and claw your way back into this Europa League 
quarter final, or do you just realise that actually all your eggs have got to go into the league basket now because you can't make another mistake? That's a really good question. Um, as a fan, I think he's got to go all, go all guns blazing. He has to. He has to because you know we the league's out of your hands now. At least you know that game is pretty far gone. An Italian team at home that's going to be very very difficult. Obviously we, we've. You know, we've still got on our memories that, that massive comeback against Barcelona a few years back, but that was at Anfield. Mm. That, and even that was crazy, do you know what I mean? So to try and go uh, to, <laughs> to a Serie A team, they're only sixth. However, they did a job. They did a real good job. They were job. tactically brilliant. They were absolutely phenomenal. I think they, I think they pretty much man-marked everyone, didn't they? There was no space for any Liverpool player on that pitch. I couldn't see any pattern of play. We got desperate, long balls started flying in. It was, um, it was a masterclass, let's be honest. Um, but I do think that Jurgen Klopp has to go there and just throw the kitchen sink at it. Because, you know, he can't, we can't have Jurgen Klopp just peter out at the end of the season. We've, you know, we've won the Carabao Cup, that's great, but... Are you, you concerned know. that it might do that? Are you concerned it might sort of go the way that Gerard went? Where, uh, yeah, he announced oh, that he was leaving. Sam, why would you do that And then everything went wrong towards like, the end of the season. Funny, just, we're trying to just like, bring Ricky, we're just trying to like, build him up a bit, do you know what I mean? <laughs> It's, you're taking great it pleasure of mine and Ricky. I'm not taking any <laughs> pleasure. Out paint. I'm He's asking the look. question. I bet he was well happy when Van Dyke slipped earlier as well. That, that slip that near. Didn't even notice it. <laughs> thing is, what you've got to do is just you've got to go and win the game. Yeah. You've got to go and win the game because yeah. of the momentum, because everything's really flat. Yeah. Yeah. So if you win the game, then you can say, OK, we threw it away in the first leg, but we've got a bit of pride in yeah. the second leg. And then you can use that as a stepping stone. That's is is that your advice to uh, Arsenal for their game away at Bayern Munich? Yeah. Go and, go and win the game. I, th I think you will win that. I well, do. I, do you know what? I, I think it's going to be really tight and I could see it going to uh, extra time and, and mm. penalties. But you've got to replicate Arsenal's performance in the second half against Bayern Munich and not the second half against Aston Villa. It's so yeah. sweet that you two are having a sort of mutual counselling <laughs> session, helping each other through these very dark times. Well, I, um, feel, Ricky, I feel your pain. I feel your pain. <laughs> I feel we can your pain. see. Uh, Manchester City beat Luton 5-1 on Saturday. That's how you get the job done, lads. Um, <laughs> perfect afternoon for Manchester City on Sunday. They arrested a few players as well. They arrested Rodri, who needed a rest after his exertions in midweek. And he said that and he got it. Comfortable win. Uh, a lot of people seem to think Ma Manchester City will win every game between now and the end of the season. I mean, we've already discussed it. I mean, you're clutching at straws if you think they're going to lose at Nottingham Forest or away at... Uh, That's been them. so disrespectful for the tricky trees. <laughs> um, they're fighting for their lives. <laughs> they're fighting for their lives at the bottom of the league. And you were at that game on Saturday. And did they beat Wolves? I, I can't remember. Um, Wolves have got 13 they, players out of injury. Yeah, and they got a 2-2 two -two draw. All oh, right. So, okay. so they're, they're likely to beat Manchester City. You're absolutely right. <laughs> um, how likely is it that they could win the treble again? It's, it's, it's likely. It's, it? it's very likely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's, let's be How much does it pain you that that could be the well, case? The Surely is, this is a great well, achievement for, for, for Pep Guardiola to, to pick up three trophies for a second time. It's never been done in the history of the world. I said that I didn't think that they would because winning the treble last season, to keep that level of uh, heart with desire, the yeah. determination... Like to go again, and everybody said, obviously, Gundogan leaving, Mares leaving, and saying, you know, that I'd say the lesser in. of a team now. Yeah, exactly. And what they've done, though, they're it's certainly just, not as good as they were last season. No, but they've no. found ways, they're finding ways. Phil Fogan, you know, when you're looking at Kevin De Bruyne, has been out stepped injured up. for it, has stepped up completely. And you're talking about, obviously, the game against Luton. Oh, I felt sorry for Onya Dimma because. Mm. You don't want to be 1v1. With, he was docu I've seen yeah. Docker do that <laughs> before docu, yeah. against Bournemouth. He's like a sewing machine, Docker, yeah. isn't he? He sort of like goes in and out very it's, so quickly that you don't even know where you are and you're tied up, trussed yeah. up well, in the a, net and yeah. you're like, oh, okay, he's gone. He slaloms yeah. everywhere. And, and he can go either way, which yeah, is the problem. Exactly. So He scores goals, creates goals, wins penalties. They're a good team, aren't they? Man? Great, <laughs> great acquisition. <laughs> good bit of business, you would have thought. They've done quite a lot of that over the course of the last few years. That's what Man City do, though. I call them the conveyor belt of talent. They've always got someone waiting in the wings to just come, come along and just, uh, you know, jump in the team if Jack Grealish isn't up to it or if he's uh, needs a rest. Or the way that they do that is brilliant. Would you and put Doku about Rodri? Would you put Doku? Oh, yeah. in, it's the first time that's happened in quite a while. Would you put Doku in place of Grealish on Wednesday night? Oh, I, I, I think the way that he played. Obviously, then if you was Docker and you was left out, yeah. you'd be very, very disappointed. And especially the game against Real Madrid is going to be really open, like it was on, yeah. in the Bernabeu. And yeah, with Docker, I think that he's the reason he was brought by Pep Guardiola is because when they're playing teams that sit deep, mm. 
he's one who's got that brilliant individual technique in tight areas, which we saw obviously against Luton, where he goes past players. And I think, and the good thing about him, he's a winger that goes on the outside. Yeah. And then, then you actually you spread the game out and then you cause problems for the opposition's defence because they have to turn themselves like 45 degrees yeah. where everything's not in front of them. So you'd have to play Doku. How concerned would you be that when Manchester City are at it, 100% at it, they still can't keep a clean sheet? Would that be in Pep Guardiola's mind at all, do you think? Oh, 100% because he's a perfectionist. We know that. Um, but they're just so good in, other, in pretty much every other area. I don't think it's a massive problem. Um, you know, Haaland... He's back on the he's back on the on the scoring form as well, and they get goals from all over. So I think I think they're all right in that department. Okay, looking forward to that game Wednesday night, Real Madrid against Manchester City at the Etihad Stadiums live on Talk Sport Two. I'll be there uh, with Stuart Pearce uh, for that one. A quick word about Luton because um, you know they, everyone sort of thought that they'd be getting tonked at Manchester City, but the fact that whilst they were doing that, Forest were unable to take maximum points against Wolves, I think might well have galvanised uh, Rob Edwards on the uh, coach on the way home. Yeah, with Luton as well, they, they give, they leave everything out there. Do you know what I mean? I've said before, they're like, analogy boxing, they're like Derek Chisora, where you know that you're going to get a big yeah. heart, you know you, yeah. they're going to come out swinging. Like, yeah, is that Rock, <laughs> Ross Barkley uh, has been brilliant yeah. for Luton. And they've, they've scored in all but five of their games in the Premier League, so they're obviously a threat going forward. I think Rob Edwards, if you'd asked him off the record, he would be looking at, and I was looking at thinking if Man City were flowing properly, you look at that, that could have been like seven. Like the last yeah. thing you want is a seven or an eight. Yeah. And I know it's, it was 5 1, but they still come with, they still had chances. Mm. Woodrow um, hit the crossbar yeah, and maybe right, yeah. could have scored. Exactly. So that's one of those games where it's, it's a, a bonus, you know what I mean? Just don't get any Luton yeah. players injured. They got, they've got a good few injuries as well, Luton. Yeah, a minute. huge amount of injuries, yeah. and that's been a real problem. They're, uh, they're, their top scorers, Adebayo, yep. is. Uh, yep. Injured, they lost obviously Tom Lockyer yesterday. Cabore couldn't play because it was against his uh, parent club. So there was, a, there was a whole dearth of people. Mengi couldn't play yesterday and he's been playing brilliantly for them. So he wasn't available for them yesterday. I don't think anyone would have stopped that uh, Kovacic goal though. Tell me, Ooh. as someone who has hit some raspers from the edge of the area, <laughs> How difficult is that technique? Oh, we talked to Ricky and all sorts of things. You know? I, <laughs> well, I, I, wish, didn't, I didn't I say they went in felt. pegs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you know what? I never shot from that far out. You have to laugh. But it's, it's as you said there, it's just perfect technique. And as soon as he hits it and you know you've hit it on the sweet spot, mm. in your head you're thinking, that's a goal. It's in, yeah. Exactly. And again, Kovacic has come in and people said, like, you know, I haven't been saying with Gundogan, but Kovacic is just a very, very good player and Man City have a lot of the ball and he's, he's very good technically. So Conveyor belt of talent. He just dips him in, buys him in, puts him to the side for a little bit and then just puts him in every now and again and then he'll be ready like all systems go next. They've still next got season. a draw left in them though from their they, they, they yeah, have, They'll they draw have. away and none of them follow. They, yeah. they have, they have, yeah. they have. So. Yeah, you two keep fingers <laughs> crossed. Uh, let's take a look at the rest of the weekend's action now and starting at St James's Park where I think Tottenham's high line was about three yards outside Newcastle's penalty area. Newcastle United 4, Spurs nil, and Eddie Howe ruthlessly exposing the high line and the vulnerabilities on turnovers of possession that Spurs have been dogged with all season. Look, Ange Postacoglu has won seven titles in his career. He's done a brilliant job in several different countries, but he is in danger of being part of the reason, at least, for them throwing away a very good start to the season. They were top of the table for 26 nights in the autumn. They now might not finish in the top four, because Aston Villa obviously winning their game on Sunday and they've dropped points at Newcastle. But it's not just dropping points at Newcastle. They were battered <laughs> at Newcastle. And 4-0 actually flatters Spurs. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. highlight wasn't high. It was stratospheric. I don't know what's happened with Spurs. Um, Postacoglu, who I think he was a breath of fresh air when he came to the Premier League. I, lo I love the way that he speaks. I love his interviews, his frankness. And I felt like he brought a, a real good you know, like style of attacking play with Tottenham. And, you know, no one was really talking about Harry Kane, were they? <laughs> like the fact that Harry Kane wasn't there anymore. Um, they were doing great. But I feel like, I don't know, it just feels like they've run out of ideas. I'm not quite sure what the problem is. But at the same time, Newcastle were exceptional. And I, I think Alexander Isak, I think he's, he's, a, he's a top, top striker. And 
pair that alongside Anthony Gordon, those two, two of their uh, recent signings as well under the new regime, it just shows the potential of what Newcastle could actually be going forward. Eddie Howe deserves a hell of a lot of credit for getting his tactics absolutely spot on. But Stuart Pearce said in commentary yesterday, an eight-year-old who's got an interest in football could work out how to beat Spurs. You kick the ball over the top of their high line and you rush onto it. And from corners and set pieces, you stick it under the crossbar and put pressure on the goalkeeper. Why has Ange Postecoglou not fixed those issues? I think he said it's like it's non-negotiables. That you, we all watched the Chelsea game, didn't we? When they like got, they went down to nine men and they still kept a high line. They yeah. still kept pressing. And what you do as a manager, you you show your players that you're not going to blink. This is how I play. If you try and implement what I want you to do, yeah. then I'll back you. What happened with Spurs against Newcastle? It's all right when they said about pressure on the ball. If there's pressure on the ball, then it's fine. If there's not, then you drop off. And it would help if uh, Mickey van der Ven weren't wearing like roller skates, to be fair. <laughs> oh, Phil, don't. He, he, looked like don't a baby, kill him. he looked like a baby giraffe. He's been, been fantastic. Like, like, he he's, he's been phenomenal. Absolutely terrific. Yeah. Yes, but, he is the fastest player in the league by a mile. They rely savior. on him exactly. so heavily. But if he has a bad game, then that system falters because yeah. he's the keystone to it. See, how many times has Spurs played the high line and you think someone's in behind him and he's the one yeah. who puts the afterburners on and comes in and just uh, nicks the ball? Um, but I have to say, you're talking about Eddie Howe. They had a little break. I think he, t- he took them away, he didn't he? He took them to Dubai. Right. That's right. And he said they reset, got their legs back. That's and exactly he, what it is. And listen, they've had some serious injuries, right? Yeah. So yesterday, Emil Kraft is playing. Anderson's playing as a sort of half Murphy position. Murphy was full back. His, yeah, he's playing right yeah. wing back. Mm. And you've got um, Anderson playing stroke left wing back, as in left inside forward. And all of them did their jobs, even though they're not necessarily the first names on the team sheet, adapted. And it was. And the system was, was terrific, I thought. And... The way that both Gordon and Isaac took their chances, yeah. terrific. I mean, it really was impressive. You know what it was? Incredible. It was. They'd worked on that in training where uh, Isaac's second goal, obviously, Grimaris doesn't even need to look because he knows that the two Spurs centre-halves are going to be on the halfway line. Isaac makes sure he stays in his own half and he just feeds it in. Yeah. And, it's a bit, and Andy Gordon, he's playing his way into starting for England on that yeah. left-hand side. He was outstanding. How, how long are Spurs fans going to be sitting there saying, actually, we like the feel-good factor. This is a 360 from what we had last year when Antonio Conte bored us to tears for, <laughs> for, for the whole of the campaign. Pavarino. And then Stellini <laughs> came in and then the janitor came in and then the geezer was cleaning the floor at Spurs. Lodge got a spell in charge. And, 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 and it was completely awful. This year, obviously, he's added a little bit of fun to proceedings yeah. and all of a sudden everyone feels... Great. Is the swing too far to the sort of... The Ange monitor gone too far that way? Because if you don't end up finishing in the top four or the top five, actually, you know, despite the fact that he said it doesn't really matter, it's not going to define me, mate. Actually, yeah. I think Daniel Levy would be quite happy if they finish in the Champions League places, bearing in mind they're going to need more bodies in the camp if they want to play European football next year. Sam, one word. Spursy. Sorry, but it's, <laughs> it comes around every time. We, we know, we know. Come on. It's the truth. It's the truth. We all know it. I've got friends that, that, that are Spurs fans, and even they say it. Comment section's just gone off. <laughs> don't kill me. Don't kill me. I, I think Spurs are a great team. I think they've got some great players. But, yeah, I, I, I just feel like the manager has he's run out of ideas. I'm not quite sure what, what the situation is. I feel like he, when he came in, it was a breath of fresh air. I just don't, I don't see any progression since the... the the first half of the season. I think no interest in answering a question about anything, by the way. He doesn't want you to ask him no, about yeah, the philosophy. He doesn't want you to ask him about the finishing position. He doesn't want to ask him why he doesn't want you to ask him why he took off this player or about that score. player. He doesn't no. want to know yeah. about anything. You actually the other week he did actually say these words. I don't really think about the score. That's one of the reasons why we come back and win games. We just keep playing. Mm. Again, and everybody <laughs> knows the score. Stop stop inventing nonsense everybody knows what the score is right because it's on a massive screen in the air in every stadium do you know what he said was he doesn't want these players to think about the score right. either because he wants them just to keep going with that belief but you have to happens, know the score no but you know the score but the thing is the score determines the way that you play because Absolutely. you're putting on a bit more pressure yeah. a bit more tension whether you've got to run the ball into the corner if you're winning whether you've got to put them in the box because you're losing game management so yeah but I understand what he's trying to say is it's As the an process. overarching yes, philosophy, and it, yes. Keep to but it. In the moment when you are there, you do care about the score. You do care about the league position. It's all, and all of the managers that try and tell you that they don't and that, that we shouldn't 
I don't really under, I don't get it. I think that sorry, Pearl. I well, think I think that's him trying to send a message to his players. I think that's him trying to like galvanise the dressing rooms and make sure that they play with no fear. I'm not going to waver exactly. Yeah, exactly. You try yeah, to yeah. as one player who I've seen at the Tottenham Stadium a couple of times get frustrated when he's been dragged off. James Madison, mm. because the, the when we know they play with a high line. I've you think before, he could have been sent off yesterday? He should have been sent. He, yeah, he should, he should have, been. have been booked twice, shouldn't he? He should have been like yeah. sent off. That's frustration because. With a doggy coming in one side and Pyro coming in the other, then there's an overload in that central area, and James Madison doesn't get that freedom as the ten. And you could tell even yesterday when he got substituted that he was frustrated. Obviously, at this point his team got beat, yeah. but you can tell he's getting frustrated. And then with Postecoglou, let's be honest, he's probably got a free season. You know, yeah. when you when you're going in, he's got a free season, and the expectation of Spurs fans now is, is oh, if you said before the season you'll get Champions League spot. They would have snapped your hands off. They'd have gone for you. if they lose to Arsenal, lose to Man City between now and the end of the season and don't finish in the top... Let's say they don't finish in the top five. Um, I think they won't be as vitriolic or as critical because they'll give him that free because of the, the football that they're playing. But if you get found out, which it looks like they have been at the moment because he hasn't got... Because the top man, elite managers... We saw Unai Emery talk about... He... he he tweaks Adjusted. things. He just stuff yeah, in games. And he goes, he went tactically at the Emirates today and thought, right, when there's no pressure on the ball, we're not going to keep the high line. We're going to yeah. drop off a bit. John McGinn playing in the centre midfield area. So you have to have that. Pep Guardiola does it for Man City. Mm. Every single game. And he, sometimes he might overthink stuff, you know, where, you know, he'll, he'll play like the goalkeeper as like a false yep. nine or whatever. But you mm. understand what I'm saying? He, he will tweak stuff around. So maybe Postacoglu will have to do that at the end of the season, have like a reset. I think the frustrating thing for, for Spurs is they're not far away. I don't think they're far away at all of being a, a top team in the Premier League. It just needs a couple of tweaks. I think it'll be a big summer for them because, well, Ange Postacoglu not only needs people to sort of buy into what he's doing, but he needs Daniel Levy to buy into what yeah. he's doing because they need to spend money to enhance that squad. And they've got the stadium to pay for. They've got the stadium to pay for. There's <laughs> other things. And you know that the results came out last week or so and they were saying that they want more investment because... You know, trying to compete in the Premier League, they need more money in order to be able to bolster that squad going into what will be an extra, what, 10, 15 games next season? They've had no European football uh, this campaign. You'll have to get a bit more flexible as well because the top managers in the top competitions will see how to approach a Spurs game and they will just do what Newcastle did yesterday. It is pretty simple. And Eddie actually needs a little bit of credit because if you go back to yeah. sort of December, January, where things were going wrong and there were all sorts of issues surrounding him, social media blowing up, saying he's done, he's finished, he's never going to be the kind of manager that Newcastle want going forward. He kept his calm, he kept his head. They have rallied. They are sixth in the table. Everybody's played the same games in and around them. They're sixth by right. They're the sixth best team at this moment in time in the country. They've had a good run since the international break. You mentioned about the Dubai trip. They've certainly got the best out of Alexander Izak as well. I asked him on Saturday, how good is he? And he just went, he's good. He's really good. People, not so good. Bournemouth 2, Manchester United 2. Wow. Defensively, they were bad on Saturday night, weren't they? It, it pains my heart when I see results like that because... <laughs> As a Liverpool fan, obviously, I, I always want Man United to lose. However, um, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Like, I just, I just, I, is Eric Ten Hag the, the man to take Manchester United to the next level? Um, you know, he won the Carabao Cup last season. He, they did all right. I just don't think he's that that person to take them to the next level. I personally think, you, know, you look at Marcus Rashford. He had that season, that great season last year. This season, he's been indifferent. I personally think. The way that he manages manages that team, I don't think some of them are having him, and I think that's what the problem is. Alejandro Garnacho has caused a You're little right, bit of there, uh, consternation. Yeah. It's actually Garnacho, but you have to say Garnacho because otherwise people just get the um. Uh, but he uh, liked a couple of posts on social media criticising Eric Ten Hag uh, from Talksport's own Mark Goldbridge, actually, uh, in which uh, it also sort of suggested that Alejandro Garnacho shouldn't have been the one that was taken off at half time. It's not a great look, is it, from Garnacho, his people, whoever runs his social media. Don't pretend for one minute that he has his own Twitter, by the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, not even Ricky does his own Twitter. Um, <laughs> um, but the fact is, is that it doesn't reflect well on the manager, does it? He knows he's going. You think Garnacho? Uh, Garnacho knows that uh, Eric Ten Hag is going. Right. You think he's toast? 
Yes, I do. And I, I think it's... He's had, he's had so many problems, hasn't he? Let's be honest with Ten Hag, yeah, off yeah, the pitch. Loads of, we know, everyone knows what the problems have been. But he's not treating... I know and managers, you do have a bit of leeway to your star players uh, because you hope they're going to perform for you. But if you obviously gave Garnacho the hook, didn't he, um, at half-time and then put um, Diallo on because he said basically he didn't track back for Clivert's goal where right. he's gone, there's, there's a big hole there and he should be tracking back and Dallo doesn't track back and Clivert scores... How many times could he have done that to Marcus Rashford this season? How many times could he have done that to Bruno Fernandes this season? So what happens with the hierarchy at football clubs is then the middle and, and uh, younger players look at that and think, well, you're not treating him the same way you're, you're treating me. And he could have taken Rashford off. He could have put Garnacho on to the uh, left-hand side, couldn't he? So I think he, he knows definitely that he, he's on his way without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I just can't see that... You know, Manchester United, one of the biggest clubs, if not the biggest club in the world, definitely, you know, one of the biggest clubs in the UK. Ten Hag isn't that man. He's just not that guy, I don't think. I, I, he, he's done OK, but I just don't think the players are having him. One of the big problems is the number of efforts on the Manchester United goal. Uh, Manchester United have had to deal with more shots in a Premier League season than Marcus Rashford dealt with in one night out in Belfast. <laughs> it's, it's been ludicrous, isn't it? The most it's has ever been all that one, accumulated <laughs> in a Premier League season since it's... Optus started accumulating wow. stats. They've wow. faced... 574 shots this season, which is averaging over 20 per That's game. in all competitions. It'll all get, what that actually tells you is that they're not tracking back. They're not doing the horrible stuff. Because yeah. if you keep like having 20 shots against, you ain't, you ain't winning any games. Yeah. So that's what's happened. Um, and there's this, uh, he's, was it um, Johnny Murta's gone, hasn't he? Um, Richard Arnold's gone to, obviously, who brought Ten Hag into it. New owners have come in. Mm. So Sir Jim Ratcliffe. Nine's out at times out of ten, they want their own man in yeah. anyway. Yeah. So I, I think obviously he didn't back him about a week ago when he was asked, wasn't he, St. Jim Ratcliffe? He didn't give in like a vote of confidence. He, so. he also stormed out of a press conference when someone suggested that they might finish lower than they've ever finished in the Premier Yeah, but he league. doesn't look at the tables though, does he? But he doesn't, doesn't, look doesn't the matter. So he's all right. He doesn't look at the table. He doesn't care about the result, <laughs> which is probably a good thing, really, because they haven't had too many good ones. In fact, they've had better ones than maybe they deserved, and they probably didn't deserve to get anything out of this game, if we're completely honest about it, because the first goal could have been uh, chalked off. Uh, for a foul and half weight. It wasn't, and I think rightly so. But without doubt, there's no way that that Bournemouth penalty that was given in the last few minutes should have been overturned by the VAR. I mean, they've been Jared guillotined, haven't they? Because there was contact inside the penalty area. It might have started outside, but the Premier League ruling is, well, the official ruling in the IFAB, uh, IFAB handbook is, if a defender starts holding an attacker outside the penalty area, and continues holding inside the penalty area, the referee must award a penalty kick. Why, is that, why has it been overturned? VAR, I mean, how? We, <laughs> no, I, I'm a dinosaur. I, I said right from the start, it's a joy sucker. This isn't a VAR thing. Take this the is other a rule book thing, right? Joy out of this football. is pretty obvious. They've just got the, the interpretation of the rules wrong. They, how, how has this not been given? He was holding inside the penalty area. Am I wrong? Yeah, no, so, it was. Yeah, well, while was on, on the edge of the... We, we've saw some, seen some steals where his foot is actually on the 18-yard line, isn't it? It continues the holding. And it goes inside. inside. Goes inside. Yeah. But what's yeah. happened is, we've said before, Sam, it's... CSI, Stockley Park. <laughs> when it's getting forensic and there. That's not yeah. what it was brought for. Do you think they should do like an Amazon Prime documentary <laughs> inside the VAR booth? One well, take swabs. Yeah. Is that what it, yeah. They're like really dramatic sort of like futuristic mu music every time they go they could and do try the to put outline. those lines on. <laughs> or do the outline around the bodies, couldn't they? We just outline around the bodies. <laughs> yeah. Just see if his arms are away from his body. He's not. not. But what is the answer? They've, they've invested so much money into this thing. We know it's not going anywhere. Got semi-automated offside technology from next season. Got yeah. about yeah. half the season. Well, no, no, a couple of weeks into, into the season. season. Yeah, once it so, yeah, so it's really on a level playing field, isn't yeah. it, all the decisions. I've, I've heard on the great one as well, I don't know if you guys have heard this, that they're trying to fast track former Premier League players or former players. Yeah, Pegs has got the call. We're fine then, it's fine. He's VAR, next, question. He's VAR <laughs> next week at Liverpool Fulham. If is it full kit referee? I need some Giacomo shorts as well if we're going to do it. But the fast tracking of ex-players... I get it because there'll be loads of ex-players who are playing in like League Two and League mm. One and, and the National League where they want to stay in football. Yeah. And if they, you know, not coaching or manage, if they do fast track, great. But when they say about, oh, we want uh, ex-players in the VAR booth, mm. whatever, I don't, I don't agree with that at all. Because all it is is another opinion, another pair yeah. of eyes. They say what well, they know the game. 
ex players don't know the actual the laws, laws of the game. They don't know the rules. That's, that's, exactly. That is a that is a big problem. Anyone who does it has to understand the laws of the game as they are written. Not the way we want them, no. the way they are written. Mm. And believe me, we don't want them the way they are written. <laughs> uh, let's take a quick look at the bottom of the table now. The relegation race is hotting up. Has anyone been deducted points while we've been in here? Uh, Brentford probably all but safe now after a victory against Sheffield United. Sheffield United minus goal difference of uh, 54. They've conceded over 80 goals this season. They're on course to concede more than anybody else in the history of the Premier League in terms of goals per game. I know that Swindon conceded over 100, but that was a 42-game season, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, they've been very poor. Done better since Chris Wilder has come in, but not good enough. You were at the Forest game. A missed opportunity, Nuno says. Yeah, I have to say, again... Uh, Gary O'Neill's done a brilliant job for Wolves. Cunha, um, obviously yeah. coming back in where he's been out injured for a uh, long period of time. Fantastic individual goal, mm. which from Nottingham Forest's point of view, they can't keep a clean sheet. They're like a really bad like mm. laundrette, aren't yeah, they? They can't yeah. keep it clean because even on that goal, when um, Cunha goes down the left-hand side, Omar bell has got him, Ryan Yates comes back, so he's shepherded him down to the touchline, and then Ryan Yates should be behind... See that? That's good reflexes. That's happened, isn't it? Careful. Better than sales, actually. In like your, first goal. You're dropping your clean sheets of paper. <laughs> yeah, but I kept hold of them. Do you know what I mean? That's not Forest card. Laund Laundrettes don't keep clean sheets. They give them back. Dry cleaners. Well, they give them back as well. So they can't keep them. You don't, you, know, you don't go to a laundrette and say, can you please keep my clean sheets? <laughs> I'll ask them to clean the sheets it's, and then can I have them back? It's not CSI matter, face, <laughs> I'd do well in the VAR room. Um, what do you do as a neutral when you see a goal like Matthias Cunha's? Oh, you, you just have to bask in the glory. It was just a great bit of individual skill. Um, he has no right to do that, really, does he? He's gone down a, he's gone down a cul-de-sac pretty much, and he's, you know, he's got a turn, and he's gone through the players, and he's just whipped into the top corner. So, yeah, great work. Yeah, well done to Gary O'Neill, because, again, they had to scratch around to get 12 senior professionals, he said, to make up the squad. But from Forrest's point of view, I think their front four are as good as any front four in the middle to the bottom of the table. I agree with I that. think with Chris Wood obviously up front, Alang was obviously injured. Yeah. Uh, Morgan Gibbs White. Gibbs -White. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't his uh, normal self yesterday, but he got a, um, a really important goal just before half time yeah. like, with his header. So, um, Danny and, Murphy and says, on the left. Danny Murphy says that he thinks he could play for a top four team more than Gibbs White. Do you agree with that? Um, I think he's got the technical ability. Mm. Um, he's got to improve when he's off the ball because that's what happens now. If you're playing at the top side, you've got to be able to, you know, defend and, and track back. But he's got that little... I think, but I think he's thriving being Nottingham Forest main, main guy. guy. He yeah. loves main guy, and exactly. He loved celebrating in front of the Wolves fans, didn't oh, he? Well, yeah. and his mate no, no, as well. Could exactly. Yeah. And whatever, they had a little bit of banter and whatever. It was quite fun, Because he did it back, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Quite liked it. It was good. But even though he was quiet yesterday... He still gets a really important goal. He's had a just yeah. before half time because it and was very nervy. Big, and he plays a big part in the second goal as well by sheer persistence running through the middle of mm. the park. Yeah, when uh, Doherty comes sliding in, um, yeah, and it was, um, as you say, it was his determination that took him through the middle. Absolutely. Um, played five side football? Yeah, in my yeah. time, yeah. And what was the position that he played? Mm, centre mid. Did you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever get really irritated when your goalkeeper let in a really stupid goal? <laughs> of course, yeah. And what did you do? Did you, how did you react to that? I uh, just, uh, you know, just tell him some uh, a few words, just like polite choice words. Polite, yeah, we, we, choice, always polite choice though. words. Yeah, always, you, always you know, polite. You a little bit sort of like firing the base, <laughs> spitting out swear words. <laughs> no, I'm more of a motivator. Like, oh, come yeah. on, come oh, on. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. like, like a cuddle, like chin up. Don't worry about it. We're all with you. It's not your fault. It's the process. <laughs> it's a whole, it's it's a whole team, collective right? responsibility. Yeah, we're not looking at the result. We don't care if what happens with the league table. It doesn't matter. We don't do individual mistakes. It's not individual mistakes. Everything's a collective mistake. Even if we pass you the ball back. Perfectly, <laughs> and you let it go under your studs. Oh man, I mean, and we're talking about Burnley yeah. and the fact that they were leading one 0 against Brighton, and then Aaron Murich let in a rather. I I never goal. understand why you sometimes you see it in cricket as well, like when they when they go to get the ball when they're trying to catch it or whatever, just catch it in the safest possible way, the safest possible way in that situation. Of him, is, is he side foot? The side the foot, pal. Loads of goalkeepers do top of the foot. Why now, don't they? I go for the studs? I don't understand that because you're the last man. I do you... feel so bad for him. <sighs> yeah, I but do. It was I do. horrendous. Yeah, yeah. And it's not the first time. It's twice in two weeks, right? Mm. So last week he kicks the ball against Dominic Calvert-Lewin. This week he lets the ball go under his studs. 
Um, as far as the Burnley fans are telling me, that actually he took too long to make these changes, Vincent Company, over the course of the season. For example, you know, Josh Cullen should have been in midfield. He was playing uh, Brown Hill in there when he hasn't got the ability to play at this level on a regular basis. This is what the Burnley fans are telling me. Um, that, that they should have got Murray in earlier to take Trafford out of the limelight because they've left it so late. He's not really up to speed, so he's making these huge, huge errors. Mm. But that's four points. Yeah. And watching Craig Bellamy do the interview afterwards, I mean, it was a bit like this whole sort of I don't look at the table business. <laughs> Craig was, Craig, you know what Craig's like? We, we've seen Craig play. Can you imagine if he was playing? Can you imagine? You, know, he, yeah. you can tell inside, like, he boiling up to, desperately him, and yeah. about to explode. But actually, that Welsh dragon being contained, he's saying, no, we're all in it together. No, honestly, it's OK. I don't think it would have been chin up, old chap, from Craig Bellamy. It might have been... Route just below his chin, just on his <laughs> neck. I'd have thought. I remember I mean? when, when Bellingham played for Liverpool, like the old, uh, the old, the old goal. Yeah, goal yeah. So, Very yeah. patient with teammates. John Arriso, wasn't it? That's right. Oh dear. Well, obviously, uh, something's happened over the course of the last few years, and he's calmed down a little bit. But uh, Burnley look like they're toast. Looks like Sheffield United are toast. Will Luton join them? Possibly. Maybe Everton as well. They play on Monday night. Um, who goes through in Europe? Do Liverpool, no. Arsenal. Manchester City and Villa all go through this, and West Ham, sorry, I forgot they were playing uh, against um, Leverkusen on Thursday night. Um, do they all go through, all five of them? No, no. How many go through out of the five that are left in Europe? I'll let you go first, Ricky. Uh, obviously, massive Liverpool fan. I'd, I'd love it, but it's not going to happen. I, can't, okay. I just can't see it. If it does, thank you, but I just can't see it. Um, so Liverpool go out. Arsenal going to go through against Bayern Munich, I feel. Um, I think they've got enough. I think the I know this result is going to have an impact on that game. We were speaking about that earlier, weren't we? Yeah. Got, and I agree with that. That will have some kind of hangover. But I think they've got enough. Um, and Man City, I think they've proven that they are they are that team, and they can they can do whatever they want. So I think they go through as well. Uh, West Ham, though. I'm going to be a little bit controversial. I don't think Man City are going to go through. Really? I think I think um, with Ancelotti, we talk about managers at the elite level. Um, how see, that, and, and how would that make you feel better after today? Uh, because it'll be a massive psychological effect on the Man City players. It might be damaging. Yeah. But I just think with just watching even the first game, you know, the, like a basketball game, was it? And yeah. Rodrigo down like the left hand side was like Vinicius. So how Junior. many are going through then? If City aren't going through, how many are going through? None. Gunas. They go through. Villa. Two. Two. Think of the coefficient, boys. Think of the coefficient. <laughs> well, actually, again, it's not happening for Ange this weekend. <laughs> to be fair with the coefficient. Poor, don't ask don't him about it. the coefficient, though. Whatever don't you. look at it. Don't, 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 don't ask him, mate. Don't look at it, mate. Um, <laughs> no good to me. That's it from us. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, we'll be back on Thursday to preview all the action in the Premier League and look back at some of the action in the Champions League. Ricky, great debut. Thanks, man. It was Ricky. fantastic. We enjoyed thank it. Thank, uh, thank nice you, to see you. you. Good luck to Liverpool for the rest of the nice season. Nice that uh, like colour coordinator. Yeah. I, I mean, I, did, I got the memo. Got the memo. Did you two, did you two phone each other up and go, what are you wearing? <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm going to go for a beige with like, a white T-shirt. <laughs> well, you're doing the same thing. I didn't go for the jacket, though, did I? Do you know what I mean? Good. Didn't get the memo. It's all right. Good. No, you're a little bit older than us. You, you, you're, not, you're not like <laughs> He's the, cute. the latest trend. Sure. Um, Perry, see you again soon. Thank you very much for your help and contribution as well. Remember, the uh, Premier League All Access podcast available wherever you download your podcast. Leave us a comment in the section. If you're watching on YouTube, if not, download it and tell all your friends about us and leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast from.